I'm so excited to introduce our final speaker, Susan Eirich. Susan is the founder 20 years ago of the Earth Fire Institute Wildlife Sanctuary and Retreat Center. It's a very special place in eastern Idaho in the Grand Teton area uh, where she's working to uh, bring back wildlife who need sanctuary and to preserve our lands. And we were discussing reconnect humans with nature, but really we're part of nature and I think we forget that a lot. And so we're gonna have some inspiration and reconnection to the creatures who share this place with us to round it out today. Please join me in welcoming Susan Eirich. Thank you. So we were gonna talk about connection and community. And I think we often make a mistake and I think we're just wired that way and we really have to work against it, that we think of connection with each other and we think of community in terms of human, but we also need to connect out larger. And there we're gonna find quite a few answers that we might not have thought of if we stay within the human frame of reference. My own background is in biology and psychology, and I ran around the world for a while wanting to get other people's perspective, see through others' eyes. And then, um, and I was working in the maximum security prisons, and then someone asked me if I wanted to help him raise some wolf puppies. And you're not gonna say no. <laughs> and that was the end of life as I knew it. And uh, I founded Earth Fire Institute, which is the name of one of the original puppies um, some 20 years ago. I think we don't understand and don't tune in enough that all life is calling us. I'm gonna share some stories with you um, as quickly as I can because it's late. And that will hopefully give that idea, but I don't know how to use the clicker. Forward. Okay. What if the earth was lonely for us and we don't know it? I attended a, uh, a retreat and people were meditating on the land and one gentleman came back saying, he heard this little voice as he was meditating. Don't forget about me. Include me. And it was the earth itself speaking to him, he felt. And later I was walking behind him, and he was talking to another woman, and she said, you know, I'm not alone. It's you, and not two of us. It's you, me, and the earth. We don't include it enough, and we'd be well off if we did. And... Also, not just what if the earth was lonely for us, but what if it doesn't want to be saved, it wants to be loved. And actually, if we loved it, we would end up saving it. Perhaps we have it backwards. My own position is that all life is sacred, and if it really is sacred, that's a radical statement, because if we really believe it, it means a profound change in how we live and how we eat and how we transport, it means a lot of radical changes. But if we don't do a radical change in how we see life, we're screwed. <laughs> but if we do, we might have a really beautiful planet to live on. We need that radical change. This is Earth Fire's work. That's Earth Fire actually herself, and that's my backyard, the Grand Tetons. The mission is to help humans change how we see that's really important, how we see, and therefore treat wildlife and nature by making us, uh, helping us make a heart connection with rescued wild animals. We love our dogs and cats. They increase our, inv our understanding and our heart connection. But we can also make a connection with wild animals that takes us out even further and to a much larger picture and helps us shift our perceptions and come up with, with new solutions. Wild animals are not secondary. That's a serious mistake that we make. Animals in general and other life is not secondary. They are companions. They arose from the same earth we did. They're portals into the mystery, and it's our loss that we don't see that. <laughs> to have animals that you could start to learn how to connect with through acting almost like a translator. That's the underlying goal of what Earth Fire is, to help people see the beauty and the richness and the mystery, if you will, and the, the wonder 
of what's on this earth with us and for us. As human beings, our relationship to nature is evolving. And we've tried several models so far, and they all have their limitations. So we need to keep working on new models of how to relate to nature. And Earth Fire can help with that because you can start to look at nature differently as not nature out there, but nature is part of us. Animals, not as strange beings out there, but beings on this earth with us, traveling the same journey with us. The vision of Earth Fire is to help forge a new way of living together on this earth. It's not about me and it's not about Jean. And it's not about animals even. It's about possibilities of a different way of being in the world with one another. So we're going to talk a little bit about connection. Charles Eisenstein, some of you might know his work, um, a brilliant guy, talks about how we live in a 10% universe, meaning only 10% left of what used to be. And I would add to that that I think we live in a 10% emotional universe. We've lost connection with so many other vibrant living beings. And I'm going to give you a couple of stories here. This is Thunder the Wolf. He was very, very old. And he's in what we call the wildlife garden. And there we have 30 other, had 30 other wolves that could not see or hear him. And he was beginning to um, fade. He lost consciousness. The vet said, you know, it's cruel for you to let him continue to live. And I did what I don't ordinarily do and decided to help him pass. It's always a huge, difficult question. What's the right thing to do for the animal? So the vet came and knelt down beside him. He was unconscious. And I was stroking him, and the vet put his stethoscope on the heart and then gave him the shot. And he passed almost immediately. And the millisecond, the absolute millisecond that his heart stopped, and all 30 of our wolves who could not see him and could not hear him gave this long, low, grieving howl. The vet stood up. He was a meat and potatoes kind of guy. He stood up and said, what, 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 what? Are you feeding him? I said, no. <laughs> this first time he ever gave us a donation after that. <laughs> um, but that connection between the wolves is frequent. This is a picture I could take a thousand times over. One unit, one unit, one unit. The telepathy connection between them. The connection between them. The connection between them. We had two bears, black bears. Um, they grew up together. Over time, Major Bear, the one on the left, became ill. They used to sleep together arm in arm through the winter. And they were very close, except for when you gave them strawberry ice cream, which I did do sometimes. And Major Bear would steal huckleberries, and it was a very pathetic sight to see. <laughs> he was trying to hide it behind his paw, and it didn't work. And then Major Bear passed away. We did everything we could. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. We took him up to a hospital, a special hospital up in Washington State. Anyway, he passed away. Maybe a couple of years later, we do retreats there. This was a retreat with California Institute of the Arts, and one of the students was very drawn to Huckleberry for some reason and decided to sit in front of his enclosure. And suddenly she felt this sadness. This is what she told us later. She felt this profound sadness, and then she found tears rolling down her face, and she said, this is really weird. She was a little artist girl from L.A. And then she heard, not words, but sort of telepathically, I miss my brother. And she said, this is really weird, because I don't have a brother. And that night, she asked us around the campfire when people dare say things that they might not say during the day. She said, did Huckleberry have a brother? That bear was communicating across species, his own grief. I think she was just open and didn't have any idea of it. I need to tell you that my own background is in hardcore science and biology originally. My father was a hardcore scientist. But part of good science is that you don't deny what you see. 
and the stories, I have many more stories to share with you that I won't be able to do now. You can buttonhole me later because some of them are just incredible and really begin to change how we understand the nature of reality, how we stand the na- understand the nature of healing. But that's a little further on. So what really happened there? How did it happen? What happened? The animals are very responsive to us and we don't know it. And they want to communicate with us on some level because they do. And we don't know it. Jill put her hands on Apricot's neck and back, feeling her way into her nervous system. After a little nervousness, she started to settle in. It was as if she sensed we were trying to help her and felt the healing quality of Jill's hands. She startled with any new movement or sound, attending to her environment for danger signals, but she quickly settled back down. She started to attend more and more to what was happening inside her. To all our amazement, she entered into a deep trance. For 40 minutes, this shy, skittish wolf lay there taking in the healing energy. When Jill felt she had done enough, she pulled her energy back. Apricot woke up and looked a bit disoriented as if she had been very far away. She looked around, slowly got up, and started to explore the yurt. As we sat there, she came back, laid down, and basically asked for more. Jill worked on it for another 20 minutes. When we were finished, it looked like she was thanking her, grateful. Instead of imposing on her system with drugs, Jill had helped her find her own energy to heal herself. The next day, though her neck was still arched, Apricot had a new look in her eye, bright, energetic. There was a bounce in her step. We asked Jill to come again. This time, Apricot pulled Jean all the way to the yurt. Because his knees hurt on the floor, we decided to try to put her on a massage table. Again, she settled down quickly in this new environment. A wolf settling in on a massage table. She went into a deep healing trance. And when we were finished, just lay there, breathing deeply, eyes closed for a long time as we watched. The third time she came in, and went directly to the massage table, stood up and put her paws on it. The treatments continue. Apricot is not yet fully healed, but she's much better. So this kind of blew me away. I wasn't expecting anything. I just grabbed a camera because I thought, what the heck? And I didn't I loved that wolf, I loved them all, and I couldn't bear to see her all twisted and distorted as if she had some form of epilepsy. So I called Jill because she does work on human um, nervous systems and thought, we'll try it, and that was the result. So there's Huckleberry with his connection, and then Apricot with that connection, and then this was a wolf that we had that we had no connection with and became ill, and but nobody could touch him, this is what happened in a sequence of three. He, he finally nearly collapsed in relief. He couldn't help himself. This is Windwalker, a cougar we had that was, you could see how he was in his um, prime of his life, not someone you'd really want to meet in the woods. That was him near the end of his life. Windwalker changed dramatically. I don't have time to explain possible reasons why. One is he might have been heard and seen by someone who's particularly good at it. Maybe it's because animals can grow spiritually over age, over years, as well as humans. Uh, we, that's a d- discussion later. But this is how he turned out in his older age. And we were able to have retreats where people would circle around him and he would just look at each one of them and purr. And they could pet him. And in the end, they could help him into a wheelchair when he couldn't walk anymore. Now look at the look in his eyes. I asked Jill to come and help him because he was having trouble with his back end because he was getting old. 
And the look is exactly the same as the one in Apricot's eyes. So now you have not just one wolf, Apricot. It also happened with another wolf, Uinta, who you saw, and a third wolf. Okay, maybe it's wolves. But now it's also cougars. Could it be that this is true for all life? At least all animals and maybe all life that responds to a certain quality of loving energy? Th that's Bluebell on the left, and Nima is a white buffalo someone gave us as a gift. So it's not just ill animals. Bluebell will come thundering across a 20-acre field when she sees people come, because most people come are interested in healing, and some have healing hands. And she simply demands it. She simply expects it. We call her the leaning tower of buffalo. And Nima, <laughs> Nima's trying to suck it in from behind. Nima was young and a little not as dominant. So they love and respond to energy. What are we missing? Meaning, what are we losing? Uh, I don't have time to tell you this story, but briefly, it was a three-legged deer who uh, was found the, like per perhaps the first day he was born and only knew humans. And when people came to visit us, he would glow, and people would glow. They really would. They couldn't tear themselves away, and I thought, maybe that's what it's like to live in a herd, because people were his herd. That's the grizzly bear that we had as a, um, we still have him very much so. Um, his name is Teton Totem. You can see them having a conversation. You can see the intelligence there. And one of the things I began to think of, and is now being shown in various, many texts now, is that intelligence seems to be a basic principle of the universe. Intelligence is everywhere. Slime molds can outperform computers. Octopuses are highly intelligent. Ravens and crows are as smart in some ways as chimpanzees. Intelligence is everywhere. Perhaps the universe itself is a seeking, creative expression of intelligence. And there's like bears, the species, and then the specific a bear, this one, expressing a seeking, creative intelligence. I should tell you so many stories about our bears. Um, Cucumber was a wolf who nearly died twice and changed from somebody who wanted nothing to do with humans to being one of our best ambassadors she, and used to meditate with us. And I don't have time to tell you now, but there are some experiences that you can only describe through telepathy. And again, I'm grounded in science. I didn't really particularly even want to believe these things, but there they were. Um, the animals want to meet when, this, when the setting is right. Um, another story I don't have time to tell you about, but this is Humble Bumble Bear. He's a learning disabled bear. That's the pie plate, cherry pie plate with ice cream. Um, <laughs> that was given to the rest of our bears, each one, and that was Humble's on the right. Um, it's the thing that I began to think about with him was he is so sweet that everyone fell in, falls in love with him. How can you fall in love with the grizzly bear? What happened? Is it possible because he had some kind of damage in his brain that underneath all the hard wiring for survival perhaps lies sweetness in all of us? Because we're all hardwired for survival, but we know what happens when we don't feel threatened anymore, how we become different. That's Earth Fire. So what can we do about all of this? Um, David Loy, a, a famous Buddhist scholar, used to talk, still talks about the Axial Age, about 2,500 years ago, when suddenly all the great religions seemed to come up at once, and then how it kind of got perverted through being taken into power and, and government and all. But it existed. And Right now, he talks about the idea that there's another great awakening, another great shift of consciousness. And we feel that all of us, all around the world, these things that are bubbling up, that are good and beautiful, and a changing awareness. Could we be at the beginning of another great age? Lewis Herman, who's another interesting scholar, talks about, well, you know, we went from arranging clamshells to the general theory of relativity in just a few thousand years. What might we do now at this critical time as we awaken consciousness to think, start to think larger and include all life in our thinking, expanding our sense of community to include 
all life, truly include them as members of the community. And how would that change everything? It would change everything. One practical thing we can do, and I want to work on with Earthfire, is um, we are basically a spiritual ecology-oriented um, wildlife sanctuary. I would love to see that going on around the whole world, that, that that seed of an idea goes around the whole world. You can work locally for pl local planning and zoning all the way up to wildlife quarters around the world. Um, add individuality into our thinking in conservation. Right now we think of species. There's a new movement called compassionate conservation. And we'd make very different decisions. We wouldn't be killing all the bears we do in Yellowstone because they're a nuisance. If we started to think of each individual as really precious, we'd probably come up with a whole set of different creative solutions. Voluntary simplicity would be a good thing. I was attending a really simple living. Um, going back to the first thing I said, the last thing I wanted to mention is the idea that um, of profound gratitude. I don't know if any of you know the work of uh, Brother David Steindl Rast. Um, and he said, mindfulness is important, but gratitude might be even more important, to be profoundly grateful for what it is that we have. Um, I was at a, at a um, retreat, and the Rinpoche Buddhist retreat was saying, you ought to meditate 108 times a day. And I figured out that's every 10 minutes. If we actually could do that, I've tried. I haven't gotten too far with it yet. But if you tried that, like every 10 minutes, just to try to reset our brain, what's important? Check out what brainwave pattern we're using, because we don't use our most creative one most of the time. Can we begin to train ourselves as a human race, as a species, to begin to think differently, operate from a different brainwave place than we traditionally do? We can fix all the problems. We can try to fix them. But without an underlying shift, we're continually going to have to sh fix problems. What's the underlying shift to see all life as precious? And thank you.